Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the World Science Festival for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And as you heard, I'm a, a neuroscientist. And since I, you know, I started in this career almost 30 years ago, what I wanted to do was to try to understand how large circuits in the brain operate. And to do that, you, know, you have almost to become a, a meteorologist because you have to chase storms, electrical storms of the brain variety. You know, if you, you have heard about brainstorms all your life, but you have never seen or heard one. So what we do in our lab is to try to capture these brainstorms and extract the messages the, the brain creates and embed in these electrical signals that can be used to do everything that we normally do as humans. In fact, I could argue that the brain is the center of the universe because everything that we do to describe the universe, uh, the universe out there, uh, comes from here, from this universe. It's much more complicated because it's, it's not only a complex universe, but it's a self-adaptive and, and uh, auto-referral universe. It's changing itself at, at each moment. It's like, a, if you could imagine this, it's like an orchestra that changes the configuration of the instruments every time it produces a note continuously. So this, this is a true brainstorm. You can see here, this color picture reflects the first time we recorded 100 neurons simultaneously in a behaving monkey. And the idea here, or the question here was, can I look at this 10 seconds of electrical activities of 100 neurons that are represented in the y-axis? So each line represents the sparking, the electrical sparking of a single cell in this brain. And I'm, at that time, we were recording five different areas in this brain. Can I actually look at this snapshot and predict half a second ahead of time where the monkey is going to move the hand? Because the monkey has been cued with a, like a, a, something on the computer screen telling him where to go to grab an object. And the brain, half a second before that happens, is coding, is transforming this visual information into a motor command. And the question we had about 10, 15 years ago was, can we do that? And I don't know if this is going to work, but I just want you to, heard what we, to hear what we heard that day. If you could make it louder. This is the sound that I would get if I would record 100 neurons in each brain in this room. This is coming from the primate that was doing this experiment. But this is the, you know, my son, my youngest son, when he got to a lab one day, he described this as making popcorn in a microwave and listening to a badly tuned AM station. And that's the essence of the human condition, not the AM station or the popcorn, but the sound. From here, we build everything that is around us. So over the years, uh, we have tried to study these electrical brainstorms using animal models. And this is the main one that I'm going to talk today. Uh, this is the brain of a rhesus monkey. Uh, and the reason we use it is because it has all the cortical areas that you see lined up here uh, on the surface. Uh, that are of interest of the kind of work that we do. There you have you know, some premotor areas, you have the primary motor cortex, the area that sends projections down to the spinal cord to control most of the muscles in our body. You have the somatosensory touch cortex, and so on. So these are the areas that we normally implant in our lab with these devices that for the last 25 years we have been building. These are sensors that allow us today to record close to 2,000 neurons simultaneously. I showed you a graph a moment with 100. I started my career recording one. And a few years after my doctoral degree, I was recording 12. So you may you know, appreciate what in 30 years, what it took to go from 12 to you know, 2,000 cells. And this technology now uses um, uh, filaments, flexible filaments like hair. And they're metal filaments covered with some plastic to isolate. Them, and you can create these cubes. They have 10 by 10 by 10 uh, microfilaments. So you have 1,000 contacts in each cube. And you can implant up to 8 or 10 cubes in the brain of an adult rhesus monkey. So if you do the math and you know that you can record two neurons per filament that you're implanting, each one of them allows you, in theory, to isolate 2,000 neurons. Because the signals you heard about are the electrical pulses produced by individual cells in the brain that we call neurons. So over the years, we have uh, perfected this technology. And these are the signals that you saw in the first slide. Uh, I just blowing up 
each one of those vertical bars that you saw, and, and you see here in yellow, uh, one example of an action potential, an electrical spark produced by one of the neurons. And basically, what our job is, is to record as many of these neurons as possible and try to look at these patterns, these spatial temporal patterns of electricity, and it, try to uh, deduct or extract the motor information that has been embedded in these signals to see what we can do with that and to learn how the brain actually operates uh, or the brain circuits operate with this kind of information. So this is just to give you a, a view of uh, the, the, uh, you know, the state of the art right now of this technology, and that's what I was saying, that we can record close to 2,000 neurons uh, with this method right now from multiple cortical areas. But the greatest advantage of this technology, in addition to get this large sample of neurons recorded simultaneously, is the fact that we can keep these recordings for years. Once we implant these devices in the brain of these monkeys, we can record every day, and in some cases here, for close to seven years we have done that, from the same subjects. So these animals can learn a variety of motor tasks, and we can basically test a variety of uh, questions uh, from the same subjects. In fact, I, I like to joke that some of our monkeys have better CVs than any student in our lab because they have all these papers in Science and Nature and all the other journals over the years that they participated as key protagonists in this study. So the yield, the large yield of neurons and the longevity of these recordings make this technology very amenable to the kind of questions that we want to, to address. And to address these questions, as I said, I was very interested since I finished my PhD and came to the US to work with a great guy called, uh, named John Chapin in Philadelphia. What are the key properties of the circuits? Why the brain utilizes populations of neurons? And why the single neuron is not really, according to this view, the functional unit of the brain, but actually networks of neurons are? You know, why and, could we, and how could we prove that? How could we test this idea? So John and I designed this preparation that we call, at that time, a brain-machine interface as basically a tool to probe brain circuits in freely behaving animals and ask questions about neuronal coding or how a circuit encodes information. In a brain-machine interface, the definition is in, is in this slide. Of course, you have to have a functioning brain, and this brain has to be implanted with sensors from which you can record the electrical signals, large numbers of electrical signals like I showed to you uh, so far. And then uh, during the time, during the time interval that it takes for a, an animal to imagine and perform a motor act, let's say 300 milliseconds, uh, this brain machine interface has to get this raw electrical activity, translate that into digital commands, and through the use of mathematical models, extract from this electrical pattern the motor information needed, let's say, to move a robotic arm. And the idea is, can animals interact with this system so that when they are asked to perform a motor task, they would do that by simply imagining the motor outcome that has to be produced to solve that task and do it through the brain-machine interface by controlling in real time the movements of this artificial device instead of using their own bodies, uh, their own upper or lower limbs to perform that task. That was the original question. Can we actually create a closed loop between the brain and a device? And by providing feedback to the brain from this device, get these animals to actually use this system to perform whatever motor task. At that time, people had no idea. This is late 90s. People had no idea, and most in neuroscience actually doubted that this could ever work, because you really could not instruct your animals directly. You could not tell them what to do. Well, they didn't know how smart rhesus monkeys can be, uh, particularly when you offer them fresh orange juice as a reward for each motor behavior that they produce in a laboratory uh, setting like this one. So our first demonstration of a brain-machine interface was done with rhesus monkeys trained to use a joystick to play a video game like we all play. And the idea here was to ask the monkeys to control a computer cursor that you're going to see in a moment on the screen with a joystick. And every time a target appeared in a random location on the screen, this monkey had to quickly move that, joy, uh, that cursor inside the target to get a drop of juice. And if he did it, 
you would got the juice and a new trial would start and the monkey would be rewarded every time he completes a trial. Well, we did that uh, for many uh, different tasks. I'm going to show you the simplest one because as the monkey was learning uh, to perform this task, simultaneously we were recording about 100 neurons from multiple cortical areas that you saw in the first slide, in the motor cortex of the monkey, parietal lobe, and other uh, somatosensory cortex. And we are basically trying to extract in real time, under that 300 millisecond interval, the type of motor commands needed for the monkey to move its own arm to perform the trick. But our idea was to translate this into digital commands that a robotic arm could understand. So that the robotic arm in a given moment would actually do the job that the monkey needed to do in terms of moving uh, towards the, the target, moving the cursor towards the target. So I'm going to show you the first sequence of experiments uh, in, one of, in two monkeys. This is our favorite one, Aurora. And she's here playing the game, as you can see. She's very agile and she loves that juice. And she, you know, is, as a good primate, she's even cheating before the target appears. She's trying to hit it by chance. You know, it's a, it's a landmark of primate behavior, cheating. And, but she cannot solve this task just by doing that because there are 32 different locations where this uh, target will appear. But every time she gets there, she gets the juice. But we are, as she's doing this, we were recording this brainstorm in real time, sending to computers they are trying to actually mimic this motor control uh, into a robotic arm that was in a different room, in a room that the monkey could not see. So after a few minutes of this uh, training, we play a trick with Aurora. We actually remove the joystick. You cannot see the joystick anymore because it's gone. We turn on the brain machine interface, and now the only way for Aurora to get the juice that she wants is for her to imagine the kind of movement that she has to perform with her own arm, but she will not move her arm now because there's no point. There's no device to control the cursor. Now, her thoughts are being translated into digital motor commands. They are going to a robotic arm, you're going to see in a moment, and now it's the hand of the robotic arm that is in control of the cursor. And is now you're going to see Aurora playing the same game for the first time. And I like to say that this is the first time a primate brain liberate itself from the physical limits of a body to interact with the world. Because what you're seeing now is a robotic arm controlled by the monkey's brain doing the trick. And this is the first time she's doing that. She's a little slower. She's trying to, to see what is going on. The cheating is still there, you can see. So we are confident that we are reproducing real motor activity coming out of a primate's brain. But low, slowly she gets it. And she's doing this. So in a month later, she's actually performing the same level that she was performing when she was using her own uh, limbs. But as you can see, there is no movement. And we are sure that because we are recording muscle activity from the surface of the limbs, and everything went flat. There was no activity coming from, from the body. But there was, of course, planning coming through the brain. So a month later, to our surprise, what is happening is that Aurora has learned not only that she can play this game with her mind and control this seven degree of freedom robotic device to play the game that you know now already, but she has not lost the ability to use her own limbs. In fact, by all uh, purposes, we had created the first monkey with three arms, two biological and one artificial, because she still can reach her back, she can try to scratch one of us, she can try to get food with the other arm. Her brain has basically for all purposes, learn how to control these three limbs simultaneously. When we look at her brain, and this is one of the main, the first main results that came out of all this work from a neurophysiological point of view, when we related in these graphs, in the x-axis, the number of neurons recorded simultaneously in each cortical structure, and the y-axis, the variance, the amount of variance that we can predict with these linear models uh, of different parameters that we're using to control this arm, like a hand position in the X dimension or gripping force because these arms can also grab objects. They learn how to reach and grab using only her brain ac activity. Uh, if you look at this graph, each color represents a different cortical field, a different location that I showed you in this graph. So the navy blue is the primary motor cortex, for instance, and the red is the primary touch cortex, and green is the posterior parietal cortex. So, if you look at these curves, 
First thing you notice that was a shock to all of us is that information is everywhere. Different areas have more information than others, and you see that by the slope. So the blue, navy blue, you can see here for 50 neurons, you can see that the most information that you can get with 50 neurons is from the primary motor cortex. But neurons in other cortical structures carry information too. It's lower, but they have information. So this movement is being represented in a huge territory of the frontal parietal circuit. It's not only in one location, like the good old phrenologist wanted to know or wanted to say, that it's just one area and very specialized neurons for moving an arm. It's spread out. Second, if you compare the two graphs, these are different parameters, you're going to see that the colors, the position of the colors uh, change. That's because you're coding different parameters, so what you're seeing is that these neurons can participate in multiple parameter coding. They can multitask simultaneously. You can use the same spikes to code for multiple things. And also, that there is a degree of specialization on top of this population coding because when you change the parameter that you need to extract, you see the changes in the colors, suggesting that the cortical areas interact in a different way uh, when you are extracting one versus another. In reality, you're extracting multiple parameters simultaneously. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this graph is to show that if you start removing neurons one by one, so if you go 50, 40, 30, 20, the performance is degrading continuously, but there is a point in which it breaks down. So when you go below 20 neurons, 10, very little can be predicted. And if you're down to one neuron, one single cell, you cannot do this control. The animal cannot play the game because the neuron is too noisy. You simply cannot extract enough information to control this device. So this paradigm is start helping us shaping a new view of the brain, a view that is much more dynamic and much more related to populations instead of individual cells. Individual neurons cannot, at the cortical level, uh, subserve any kind of behavior. You need populations to do any kind of thing that we consider meaningful. The other interesting thing is that if you now blow out that graph and you get uh, the properties of individual neurons plotted, like in these graphs, on the top you see this yellow diagonal, and it represents a property of 122 neurons that we randomly sample in the motor cortex of these animals. This is directional tuning. It's how neurons respond in terms of number of action potentials to different directions of movement. That's the reason the graph goes from um, in the x-axis from minus 180 to plus 180. And the reason you see a diagonal, yeah, the color is proportional to the number of electrical spikes that a neuron is producing. Each line on the y-axis is a neuron. The reason you see a y, uh, 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 yellow diagonal is because all directions of movement are represented in this random sample of primary motor cortex. And that's you know, well established because, of course, if you want to move your limb everywhere, you have to represent all potential directions in your brain to do that. Well, the bottom graph was expected to be completely bluish, meaning that no neuron was firing because the bottom graph represents the moment in which the animal is not making any movement of the body. It's just controlling the robot directly with brain activity. But what we notice is that there is yellow, there's plenty of yellow. It's just that the cells now change their tuning. And they were reflecting now is the directions of the robot movement that we put, that we define for Aurora to use in the, in the videos that you saw. So these neurons became correlated, they're fine, became correlated to the robotic arm not to the uh, actual limbs of the monkey. And if you flip, if you turn off the brain machine interface and you ask the monkey to actually do the movement again with the arms, you go back to the top graph instantaneously. So there's this level of plasticity, a rearrangement that occurs and is very quick. Just if you provide visual feedback from the robot working, the animal will be able to literally assimilate the properties of the robot as an extension of the animal's body. And that became our hypothesis. When we found these results, we suggested in our paper in 2003 that what we had seen was a literal assimilation of this artificial device as an extension of the body representation that exists inside the brain. At that time, we didn't know about experiments that were being performed in parallel in other laboratories. Uh, they were published almost at the same time, like in this 2004 study, 
uh, by Dr. Iriki in, in Japan, which supported the same result we, that we had with a completely different setting. In these experiments, Dr. Iriki was giving these uh, monkeys uh, a rake to reach for grapes that they could not normally grasp with their own hands. So the monkey is eager to get these grapes, but the arm is too short. So Iriki just gave this little uh, tool that they could go there and basically get them. And meanwhile, he was recording in the parietal cortex uh, of these animals, and he was getting neurons that are known to have bimodal or multisensory receptor fields. They had a tactile receptor field in the hand, which is convenient, but they also had a visual receptor field surrounding the hand, what we call the peripersonal space. And that's what you see in the first uh, graph on the, on the left here, on, my, on the right on, on the screen. So, but the moment Iriki gave this rake for the animals, and the animals got proficient in getting the grapes, what you will notice is that the purple uh, area or peripersonal space of the response that drives these neurons to fire now includes the rake. So in a few minutes, these neurons had assimilated the space around the tool as if it was a continuum with the arm of the monkey or the hand of the monkey. And Iriki has done these experiments in many conditions now. And if you do a 3D movement or if you use just a computer screen to show a virtual reality tool, you are going to get the same effect, provided that the animal is controlling or involved in getting this tool to do something meaningful. So that was very supportive of our hypothesis that the sense of self or the representation of the body and the brain is really dynamic and it can be expanded to include all the tools that we normally use in our life. So all the technology that we create, our cars, our bikes, golf clubs, soccer balls, everything that we normally create to extend our reach into the world from the brain zone point of view becomes an extension of ourselves. Another study that supported this was done here in Princeton by Jonathan Collins' group, and it's called the rubber hand illusion. It's the opposite of the phantom limb sensation, and it's very interesting because uh, if you get a regular person and you put a platform uh, 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 that basically occludes the, ver the view of the person's own arm, let's say the left arm, and then you put in front of this person a rubber hand coming from a store mannequin, one of these mannequins that you see in the windows, and you put in front in an anatomical position that is very correct, coming out of the elbow, let's say, coming off the elbow. And now you get two brushes, identical brushes, and you start touching the fingertips of both, the rubber hand and the real hand at the same time. And in, after three minutes of doing that, and the, the person can only see you touching the rubber hand, he cannot see you touching the biological arm. But after a couple minutes, you just, without telling anything, you stop touching the biological arm, this person, or 80%, above 80% of the, the subjects, will report to you that they feel the touch on the rubber arm. They actually have a feeling that you're touching them, uh, their skin, even though you're touching a piece of rubber, okay? And so this became known as the rubber hand illusion, and it's also supported the view that very quickly, the brain can assimilate an artificial tool as an extension of ourselves. Particularly since I'm originally from Brazil and soccer is in our DNA, I thought, I call this the Pelé theory in honor of uh, the greatest soccer player that ever played this game on this corner of the Milky Way, uh, Pelé of course, because I, what I propose in, in the paper, in the book I described this was that if I ever had the privilege of mapping the motor cortex, the foot representation of the motor cortex of Pelé, I would not find only a foot. I would find a hybrid, uh, a, a, a real merge between a foot and a soccer ball. Because if you have played 1,300 games and you scored 1,280 some goals during, during 22 years of your life, almost every three days, every year, uh, that ball is part of you. And our phones are part of us, our computers, our iPads, our clothing, our glasses. Everything that we basically develop and becomes attached to us under the control of the brain or providing feedback to the brain or realizing an effort to reach out to the world, that technology becomes us. And the, uh, the hypothesis here is that the sense of self 
extends itself to go to the limit of their tool. And that's the reason surgeons actually feel when they're using scalpels or tools to operate, they actually feel the texture of the organs that they are touching with those devices. And we, when drive, we can actually sense the texture of the surface we are driving on. So, I told you that this is happening because the brain is plastic. It's basically auto-referral uh, and is self-organizing and changing itself. That's the analogy that I use for the orchestra. But how plastic it is. What is the limit of this plasticity in adult animals? Uh, we don't know the, the final answer to this, this question, but I'm just going to show you something that is pretty out there at the limit, I think. So Eric Thompson, a, a scientist working in my lab, a neuroscientist working in my lab, asked this question by, in a different way by asking, can we actually induce adult animals to acquire a new sense? Can we create a prosthetic device that makes animals experience something that they never experienced before and make use of that information? In this case, adult rats were, uh, that, of course, as you know, n could never see or feel infrared light because they don't have, like most mammals, don't have any photoreceptor in the retina that detects infrared wavelength and don't have a thermal receptor in the skin like snakes that can perceive the heat generated by infrared. Eric asked the question, can I make these guys experience infrared? Basically, what he did was to get infrared sensors implanted on the skull, and when infrared information was delivered to the sensors, uh, an electrical pulse was generated, electrical train of activity was generated from these sensors. So what Eric did was first to deliver this in the middle of the touch cortex, particularly in the area of the sensory cortex in which rats process information coming from their whiskers, facial whiskers, which are for rats like our fingertips, the most sensitive tactile organs that rodents have. And Eric just asked the question, can I get this output of infrared sensors put in the middle of the brain of these animals, the touch cortex of these brains, and get them to track beams of infrared light to get a sugar water or even water, only water, as a reward? And this is what happens. This is an infrared environment. You're only seeing this because we are taping with an infrared camera. And what you're going to see is that from one out of four ports that exist in this arena, a beam of infrared is going to come, and this animal is going to basically track this beam of infrared, not by seeing it, but literally by touching otherwise invisible light. It's using the somatosensory cortex to experience invisible light as part of its new sense of touch. And that's what they do. If you could... Uh, get the volume a little higher, what you're going to hear is the beam turning on and then the transduction of this, this invisible light into some sort of sensory sensation and the animal goes and tracks that beam as if he's being touched in the face. The, the closer he gets to the source, the stronger the tactile sensation he experiences. So he basically created a transform that makes that invisible light uh, uh, something that he can perceive. And if you look at the brain of this animal a few weeks later, uh, what you find is that if you go to the, the middle of this uh, somatosensory cortex, is yes, cells are still responding to mechanical displacements of the hair in the face, as they should. Yet, they are also responding to different frequencies of infrared, infrared light. So these cells are multiplexing now, tactile and infrared information. So from a primary piece of cortex that was supposed for the rest of the life of this animal to only code for tactile information, we are now uh, able to extract multimodal information. And it doesn't need to be uh, only the somatosensory cortex. In fact, if you use 300 uh, or four sensors in the head, it takes three days for the animals to learn how to use this prosthetic device. If you use only one, it takes uh, three weeks. But now if you put the same four infrared sensors and get the output to the visual cortex, a piece of the brain that is used to process visual information, it takes six hours for the animal to gather uh, all this together and to operate this prosthetic device. And more interesting 
in the latest experiment that Eric ran, he divided half of the information about where the animal has to go into the visible spectrum and half into infrared spectrum. And the animals actually merged both and solved the task. So you're going to see now is a version of the same task in which one port has nothing, one port has only visible light, the other port has only infrared, but the correct port has both visible and infrared. And of course, it's changing positions from trial to trial. So the animal, to get the water now, has to go to the port that has half of it in visible spectrum and half in infrared. And as you're going to see, they learn in a, in a couple weeks to actually solve this pretty difficult task. What they experience, of course, I have no idea. So you see that uh, visual distraction, no light, infrared, and a combination of both is right there. And the animal basically goes to the one that has half invisible light and half in infrared. We switch the position so they don't have any spatial bias, and boom, they do that close to 100% after three weeks. So you literally create a new perceptual experience for these guys. So that's how plastic the system can be. So after 20 some years of work on this system, we had a series of principles. I'm not going to bother you. These are physiological principles that create a new view of the brain, in particular the cortex, this most superficial part of the, you know, where our memories are located and most of our higher cognitive abilities emerge from. And basically, these principles uh, say that you cannot do these computations with individual neurons in each circuits. The same combination of neurons can produce multiple outputs. A given output, let's say move my arm like this, can be generated by multiple combinations of neurons. So you don't, you don't need a fixed group of cells to produce this. And it makes total sense because if some of the cells die, would you lose suddenly the ability to move your arm? No, because that's what the beauty of the brain. The brain has 100 billion neurons, has millions of neurons, hundreds of millions of neurons in the motor cortex. And I think the reason we have so many neurons is because at each moment in time, the brain can draw from this huge pool a subset that can produce a particular behavior. So if some of these neurons die, there's always some new combination that can be recruited to produce the same combination. That, going back to my medical school days, may explain why it takes a lot of lesion of gray matter to produce a motor deficit. You may have to destroy a huge amount of your motor cortex for you to, as a clinician, to see some deficit because the brain is always using this distributed uh, mode of operation. So I'm going to skip this and go to, before I talk about potential applications of brain-machine interfaces to the clinical arena, which was a total uh, accident. It was not a design by design. We use these apparatus to test how brains and circuits operate, but we discover halfway through that they can be used for clinical things. I'm going to show you the limit of the field. Uh, we have now uh, tested a variety of, of, of paradigms involving brain-machine interfaces, but the latest is this one, is a brain-to-brain -brain interface. And the reason this was done is because we know for a long time a big problem in, in systems neuroscience is to explain how multiple areas of your brain come together and synchronize to generate a common function, to generate this, this kind of movie that we see continuously. Uh, how is that different parts of the cortex and subcortical structures come to work together? And since it's very difficult to you know, cut pieces of the brain and test these ideas, we decided that one of the easiest ways or easier way to approach this problem was trying to link brains and see what happens. So this was the first attempt. This is a brain-to-brain -brain in rats in which you have an explorer animal and a, and a decoder, an encoder animal and a decoder animal. The encoder is the guy who does the heavy duty. He's getting a visual stimulus, for instance, and he's deciding whether he should press the left or the right bar to get a reward. And he has been trained to, to recognize that when the light comes on the left, he press the left. When it comes on the right, he press the right. Um, when he does that, we are recording the brain activity that is related to this decision, this motor decision, and we are sending this electrical activity from about 50 neurons or so to a second rat that has not received any visual information. He's familiar with the task, but he has not seen any light. 
The only information that he's getting to solve the same task is whether uh, is what is coming from the encoder. And he has to decide whether going, going to the left or to the right of, to get his reward. Well, uh, that's exactly what this interface does. It records the brain activity of the first animal, the encoder, while the animal is making that decision, transforming a visual cue into motor information. It transforms this information into a signal that is delivered as an electrical message to the motor cortex or the somosensory cortex of the second animal, and we are, uh, wait for the second animal to make a decision, to decide where to go. And I have to tell you that some of these experiments, the two rats were not even in the same location. One rat was in Brazil, another one it was here in the United States, and we broadcast this through a very fast internet connection. So let me show you how it works and just tell you some of the things that happened during these experiments. That was very interesting. So this is a, a video of uh, this uh, task. Here is when the animal gets light to go to the left. It bar press, this is the encoder. Now we get a message from the encoder transmitted to the decoder. Both lights turn on so he doesn't know where to go. He's checking the message and he decides to go to the left. That happens in 70% of the trials. So we can get these animals to respond correctly with very simple messages. There's only one channel uh, that we tested when we started. This is to show you that he can do it to the right too. So the encoder got the correct message and he's now pressing the right lever to get the reward. What you see in the background is the brain, is the brain activity of the encoder that we are broadcasting to the second animal. And I have to tell you, there are many interesting caveats of this experiment. First of all, when we did this same test using the whiskers, the animal had to touch something with the whiskers and decide whether it was narrow or wide and then we transmit this information to the second guy, and the second guy goes there and decides. What we notice in the brain of the decoder was the emergence of a representation of the whiskers of the first guy. So in addition to having a map of the whiskers of its own body, which everybody, every rat has, cells there were starting to represent whiskers of the encoder, like you had two maps embedded in one piece of cortex. Second thing that was interesting is that we had a little uh, closed loop signal between the decoder and the encoder, and it was done through reward. Basically, it was the following. When the encoder got it right, when he got the visual information pressed correctly, he got, a, let's say, a piece of food, a piece of, you know, something that they liked, a rat shell. But if the decoder got it correct also in the same trial, the encoder got a bonus. Now we're in New York like Wall Street, right? They got an extra bonus and they loved that because that was unexpected. Well, if in one trial the, the encoder got it right but the decoder didn't get it, this guy will not get the bonus. So what we notice is in the next trial, the encoder would slow down the movement, clear up the signal-to-noise ratio of the brain activity, almost like saying, you know, you idiot, get it right now, because <laughs> I want this extra shell. And invariably, in that trial, the decoder got it correct. It was easier because the this brain signal was cleaner and the movement was smoother. Well, after a few trials of the decoder getting it right, the encoder went back to the lazy way to do it, seeing if he could get away with a dirty brain signal and a sluggish movement that was not as clean. And sometimes, of course, he did. Well, this was one version. The, the second version is more sophisticated in some sense, involves monkeys, and it's very interesting because it's also going into the direction of trying to understand how many areas of a brain synchronize. But what I'm going to show you, I don't have time to show you all the experiments we did with this. These are the one that I like the most is the a brain net. We call this a brain net. And it involves three monkeys. It's this first cartoon that you see here on uh, letter A. The goal here of the monkeys, or the brain net, is to move a virtual arm in three dimensions. Like you saw Aurora in two dimensions in that screen, here is a 3D task. The arm, the virtual arm has to go to a target, cross the target, and get a reward. But to get there, there are three monkeys in the lab, 
the monkeys don't know that there are other monkeys together. The monkey just thinks that, you know, I'm the only one here probably. And the, the, the way this control is done is the following. Monkey one mentally produces, like Aurora did, X and Y dimensions of control. Monkey two controls Y and Z. And monkey three controls X and Z. So for this arm to literally move correctly in 3D to the target, at least two of the three monkeys have to synchronize their brain perf perfectly so these X and Y and Z dimensions are produced simultaneously and the arm can move. No single monkey can solve this task. And for them, it's very frustrating because what they are seeing in the screen in each one of the lab rooms is just the projection of the two-dimensional part that they need to control. So they may be doing that very well, but the arm may not move because the third dimension may not be done correctly. So to see how engaged these guys are, I just brought to you this little video of these two monkeys, two out of three, playing the game. And you can see that they're pretty concentrated. They're focusing on the screen. That's the arm, that's the target. And of course, they don't know that there are other monkeys uh, collaborating. A computer is getting 300 cells per monkey and merging these into a 1,000 cell, a 900 neuron uh, brain that is controlling this in real time. And the only thing they get is the visual feedback and reward where the things happen. So I just want to give you, and they do, they do that uh, above 70% correct. But I want to give you a feeling, a, a visual feeling of the dynamics of these three brains playing this game together. So each color, blue, red, and green, represents a single monkey brain, producing a two-dimensional output. The black dot represents the sum of this output, and the big circle is the target that is moving on the screen, and the monkeys have to reach it for it. And what we're going to see is how these guys interact. And interact they do. You can see that there is a dance. Sometimes, like in a moment ago, the blue brain got out of the, the frame because it was you know, relaxing for a moment, while the two other monkeys had to grab that slack and, and convert that you know, variance into the needed movement to get the black dot in there. So you see that sometimes a monkey has to go way out there to compensate for errors produced by the other monkeys. But nonetheless, they're collaborating. They're interacting. And they're producing a common output. And when we look at their brains individually and put them together, uh, we measure the amount of synchrony that they're producing. To our delight, we saw, and that's the blue line in this graph, we saw that to perform the trials correctly, they had to achieve a very high level of synchrony with a resolution of 10 milliseconds. So otherwise, the red light, the right line shows you the errors they commit. And that's where synchrony goes way down. So we basically show that we, what may happen in a lot of our behaviors as groups of humans or groups of primates, imagine a basketball team or a crowd in a stadium or a symphonic orchestra playing, external feedback signals may be used to actually synchronize our brains into what I like to call an organic computer, a basically a network of brains that are operating under very close synchrony levels or very precise levels of synchrony to actually achieve a common behavior. And the emergent properties of this brain net or this organic computer is what we see. You know, when a soccer team scores a goal, when a basketball team makes a play that is perfect, when a crowd sings together in the stadium, uh, likely what we are proposing is that that is due to this high level of synchrony that you can establish uh, across brains. And now in labs, we can study this. We can simulate that through a shared brain machine interface. That's basically what a brain net is. But let me go back to the original idea of brain machine interface and show you how in science sometimes you, you create something for a purpose and in the middle of the way you find a completely different application. Well, a couple of years after we published the first study with brain machine interfaces, John Chapin and I published this article in, in Scientific American, then an, uh, an article in Nature, where we proposed that brain machine interfaces could have a clinical application. Suppose you have, like in the cartoon showing there, uh, a patient that has a spinal cord injury in which signals that are generated, motor signals that are generated 
uh, in the cortex, in the motor cortex, like you saw, cannot reach the spinal cord and cannot go uh, directed to be directed to the muscles. So movements can be generated from voluntary motor intentions. Well, we proposed in 2002 that perhaps we could create a bypass. We could basically create a brain-machine interface to read these voluntary motor intentions in these patients, and through a computational interface, extract the motor programs and send it to a new body. If you are paraplegic, an exoskeleton that would cover your lower part of the body and be controlled by your own motor thoughts and provide to you because you, know, you could instrument this system with pressure sensors, as you're going to see, and provide to the subject feedback. So every time the subject touches the ground, for instance, walking with this device, this feedback would be broadcast back to the brain so that the patient would not only move, but had a real perceptual experience of walking again. Because you may realize that when you have a, a severe, complete spinal cord injury, you not only lose the ability to move, but you also lose the ability to feel where your body is. And your brain it starts forgetting the concept of having legs or walking. The brain literally removes that from neuronal space. So it so happened that a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to uh, be in the right moment at the right place. We knew that this could be done. We did several experiments in monkeys suggesting that what I just described could be built for humans. Uh, so we created this consortium called the Walk Again International Nonprofit Consortium. And I was in the right location where, after Brazil was uh, selected to host the uh, World Cup in 2014, the Soccer World Cup, uh, the president of Brazil at that time wanted to basically uh, create something different, have a, in the opening ceremony some sort of scientific demonstration. And I got in a meeting, imagine this, a scientist coming from the United States, going to a meeting with all these politicians and saying, what about if we have a paraplegic Brazilian using a brain control exoskeleton to deliver the opening kickoff of the World Cup by being in the field, kicking this ball, and not only moving, but being able to feel the contact with the ball. And of course, people look at me and say, who are you? And I said, well, I'm the guy who knows a few people that will be willing to do this crazy thing together. And they signed, the, it was the best peer review I ever had in my life because it was signed immediately. And I got out of that meeting knowing that it could be done by having no way how to do it. And I got on the phone with a few friends. And I have a few friends all over the world, uh, roboticists, computation, computer scientists, engineers of all sorts, narrow rehab personnel in Brazil that came together and decided to do this thing together. And that was the purpose of the project. So we create a network of laboratories around the world. We create, in Brazil, uh, what I consider today the most advanced neurorobotics, neuro rehab laboratory in the planet right now. And we start basically recruiting uh, a group of eight patients, all chronic spinal cord injury patients that have been paralyzed uh, completely for almost a decade, some of them more than a decade. And the idea was let's retrain the brain using plasticity with the ideas that I described to you. Let's put these guys into an intense regime of retraining so that we can reinsert in their sense of self the concept of having legs. So we create virtual, a virtual stadium, a virtual reality stadium where these guys would go and use their brains to control a, a virtual player, an avatar. They had to walk and kick balls an hour a day. And we are measuring the brain activity and we're delivering tactile feedback in their arms. And basically, they start having again the feeling of standing, walking, and kicking. And we can see in their brains ex the expansion of the representation of their lower limbs as training went by. So by the time they reach uh, a proficiency level in the virtual reality environment, we move them to an exoskeleton. We are in the third prototype now. This is the original prototype used in the World Cup. Uh, is an electrical uh, a hydraulic device controlled by non-invasive EEG signals, so we didn't need to put anything inside the head. This is on the surface of the scalp. But this device uh, is also sensorized with these uh, sensors that my good friend uh, Gordon Sheng developed at the University, uh, Technical University of Munich, and it's called the artificial skin. These are printed circuit boards, very thin printed circuit boards that contain pressure 
temperature and proximity sensors that we can apply in key locations of the exo, like the plantar surface of the feet, so that when the subject touches the ground, uh, you can see here, a pressure wave is generated. You can see the pressure wave on the screen of the computer as the sandal is touching the, the table. And then this pressure wave that codes contact and you know, the time of contact with the ground is delivered through a haptic display, that's how we call it, it's like vibromechanical elements that we apply on the skin of the arm and both arms uh, using a, a shirt. So the patient wears a shirt that contains on these long sleeves these elements. You apply this to the forearm skin. We transduce these pressure waves into tactile stimulation. And by correcting the parameters, finding the correct parameters for magnitude and time of spread, we discover a way to induce phantom limb sensation. So these patients now would report to us even though they're standing upright, hold, held by a table that you know, allows them to be upright, and they're controlling an avatar walking in a virtual stadium, they would report to us the sensation of walking, that they are feeling that they're walking, they're touching grass or sand or asphalt. We could make them discriminate very fine distinctions in these surfaces. So when do we put them in the exoskeleton, as you're going to see now, uh, oh, this is just the virtual reality environment, so you have an idea. So this is a virtual avatar, soccer player, whose movements are controlled by the EEG activity of the patient. They're standing up, walking, and kicking a soccer ball. We put this sound in the background. This is Turkish soccer fans screaming all sorts of obscenities that I don't even know what they are. But we put this as distractors because they were going to be, these patients are going to be in a stadium doing the demo and there'll be 75,000 crazy Brazilians singing and 1.2 billion people watching. So there's a lot of pressure. And we discovered that people can focus on this task despite this huge distraction of sound, flashes, and other things that we created to get them out of their you know, ritual. Well, this is something I never thought I would see in my career, but uh, it so happened that I did. This is the first day one of these paraplegic patients actually walk again after 10 years in a wheelchair. And he's using the brain activity to move the exoskeleton. And as he touches the ground, he's getting that sensation. And he, I don't know if you can see it, he's looking in a mirror because we all the time reinforce the body image. We're giving every feedback we can to the brain to see the body walking. And at the end of this walk, it was the first 12 steps that he did in a decade, he's telling us, he's reporting the sensation of feeling his own legs moving in space and touching the ground and, and reporting what it is to be up and walking, which, of course, we never expect to hear in, in, in a lifetime, but it happened. This is, uh, I cannot show you the actual footage of the opening ceremony because, as you probably know, FIFA requires that we pay for the footage. And scientists don't have money, the kind of money that FIFA usually handles, you know, to, to, to pay for this footage. And, and, and they never gave us the footage. And they don't leave, give us the rights to show the image. And let me explain why some of them are in jail in New York, you know, <laughs> right now. Uh, but, and others are in, on the way. But, uh, and they would search us when we went to the field. Giuliano, the patient, basically uh, paralyzed two-thirds of the body from T4, this level, down for 10 years after a car accident. Giuliano performed 57 attempts in the field prior to the World Cup. He got 56 kicks right using this device. He missed one because they put us on a, on a place of the field There was a slope that they never told us of five degrees, and of course, you cannot correct five degrees on a robot like this. But nonetheless, it was much higher than the rate of uh, correct kicks than the Brazilian national team did in the World Cup, <laughs> right? And they wouldn't allow us to tape anything, but uh, you know, in Brazil, you're a Bra there are Brazilian neuroscientists in the group, we don't know who, had a cell phone hidden somewhere. So what I'm going to show you is the last kick on the ramp, going to the stadium. Imagine, there are 75,000 people screaming in the stadium. This guy had to use its brain, his brain to control this device. And he said, look, I want to try one more time before we go there. So I have the footage of this. And he shows the operation of the exo. 
and what we wanted to broadcast, because in the beginning we had three minutes to do this demo, but because we didn't have money to pay for the time, we were reduced to 29 seconds. And nobody has ever done a robotic demonstration with 29 seconds in an open soccer field. There was a little pressure there. So what you're going to see is that when the blue lights start blinking, is because the exo is ready to receive brain commands and is broadcasting tactile feedback already. So Juliano feels that he has ground under his feet, which is very important. And when the lights go green and yellow, it's because Juliano has made a mental decision to move this stuff. And you're going to see a ball being placed in front of him, and of course, he delivers the kick. That's what he did uh, in the opening ceremony of the World Cup. So he made the decision, the exo is recognizing, and now he's ready to go, and he now just releases, and he kicks the ball. And the most moving part of this, I was behind him, you know, in the stadium went crazy, and we are just celebrating like a goal, and Julian is telling us, I felt the ball. He's screaming because, you know, not only he moved, but he actually felt the impact because we had sensors on the, you know, on the foot that allowed him to feel that. Well, we thought that this was the biggest surprise, that we had succeeded in 18 months to go from nothing to a brain control exoskeleton that allowed someone to walk again and feel. Yet, the biggest surprise came 30 days later after the end of the World Cup. That's when we are scheduled to re uh, repeat the neurological examination of these patients that we do every six months. And for 10 years, that neurological examination had been repeated and nothing changed. Because once you have a spinal cord injury that settles down, it's very difficult to get any recovery. Well, we did the tactile examination in the zone of uh, partial preservation, that is where you, the patient still has some tactile feeling around the lesion, had expanded five segments down below the level of the lesion. They were feeling part of their legs now. So Julian was a T4. He became a T4, uh, T11, because he got about five segments down. Others went even further. Well, that was a shock already. But one of my students said, OK, well, let's do the motor exam. We, we put uh, electrodes all over the legs and trunk of these patients. We record muscle activity in someone that had never had muscle activity since the lesion, this is without the exoskeleton. And we asked them, could you try to move? And what you see here are muscle contractions happening all over below the level of the lesion. So when we actually did an animation of this, this is an average of all eight patients because they all had something. What we saw is what you're going to see here. June 2014, February, nothing. June, we couldn't see much. But then, September, there's some things showing up. December 2014, lots of muscles. We are now two years since that. We repeated this demo just three months ago, this test, I'm sorry, neurological test, and the recovery has not stopped yet. So what does it mean? It means that we started, if you look at this graph here, we started with, as I told you, eight complete lesion patients. They had no movement, no sensitivity. 12 months after the training, half of them were upgraded to partial paraplegics. 24 months later, seven out of eight now are partial paraplegics. What does that mean visually for you who has never seen one of these patients or never in interacted? Um, these are two women that, and this is the test we normally do. And it's very frustrating. You, you suspend the patient from a, a frame. You put the tips of the toes on the ground. And you ask them to try to walk. And of course, most of the time, until now, nothing would happen. So it's very frustrating. It's very sad to, to do the test for both the patient and the physicians. Well, look what happened 12 months after the training started. This is one of the patients that was there for 12 years. And she can now step. She has now sensation of the, all the region below the level until the, the knees. And she can contract muscles all the way to the sacral roots. This is my favorite, because it's almost like a ballerina trying to step again. She was 14 years in a wheelchair. And this is after just about nine months of training, suggesting that that plasticity that I showed you 
with the little red is not an abstract kind of thing. And if you really understand the language of the brain and you're able to actually interact correctly, what messages you get out, what messages you give it back, plasticity may do this to you. And that's what neuroscience is after. It's not only an abstract quest to understand what we are, which is already a big one, you know, why we see the world as we see, but it's a quest to give back to people that lost these simple behaviors, the ability to feel the dignity of walking by themselves again. Thank you.